Saskatchewan, home of all types of beautiful wildlife and scenic views. But beneath the beauty lies a dark secret, a drug crisis at its peak. 2020 was the worst year for drug overdoses in the province. With 233 confirmed overdose deaths in 2020, Saskatchewan has smashed the former 2019 record of 177 by over 30%. With the drug crisis at an all-time high, and the current confirmed or suspected overdose death toll of 2021 already at 75 in the first two months, it can be hard to believe that it will get any better soon. But with more support systems for people struggling with addiction than ever, and a growing push for the government to change its policies, things may be looking up. Yeah, so a safe consumption site is a medical facility where people can come and use drugs under the uh, observations of a medical professional. We're also the only one in the in the in Canada that operates a safer smoking space, and so we're technically the only safe consumption site in the entire country because we offer all four modes of ingesting drugs. Yeah, we fully expect more to open throughout the province. Um, we've told communities pretty clearly, uh, you know, if local orgs step up, we're willing to support them, uh, not just for safe consumption sites. Uh, we need drug testing clearly in the province. Uh, we need safe supply in the province, um, you know. And I think we're gonna we're gonna be able to get it, but it's it's not gonna be it's not gonna be achieved by sitting back and waiting for policymakers to decide if it's right or not. I think I think it's pretty clear community needs to step up, and we need to step up in a big way. And you know, we're we're not really apologetic about people's right to live. You know, Regina's definitely seen the lion's share of overdose deaths. They clearly need the overdose prevention site that should be opening up pretty pretty quick here. I think we're able to mitigate some of that in Saskatoon because we do have the safe consumption site, but also because we distribute a lot of naloxone kits in Saskatoon. Our agency uh, employs peers to go distri distribute naloxone kits throughout Saskatoon. And I think that that's been of benefit for us because you know, they're able to go into places that our staff normally couldn't go into and then make sure that they can be as safe as humanly possible. Yeah, I think in rural areas, uh, you know, there's there's some multiple options that we can implement. The first one is safe supply. Uh, then the other is we could easily have remote safe consumption sites where people call into a secure line or they video conference into a secure line. They're observed by somebody who doesn't even need to be where they're sitting um, or in their community. They're doing those types of things in, in central BC. Um, there's no reason why we couldn't implement them in Saskatchewan. I think what we're worried about right now is the narrative is very much largely, well, we just need to get these folks into treatment. That's totally true if, if the person's willing and able to go to treatment, uh, but people in rural settings are not gonna want to engage a lot of times with people in their community because if you're in a community of a thousand people, uh, you're going to be very much outed if you're going to, if you're lucky enough to even have an able exchange there, let alone to be living with addictions. You know, the, I think the narrative often, especially with politicians, they try to build the narrative that this is a COVID related issue. It's simply not the case. It's totally blind to the fact that the tainted drug supply is alive and well in Saskatchewan. Uh, more and more we're seeing people come in who had fentanyl pushed on them and they're now addicted to fentanyl. And so we're seeing a lot of people drop because of cocaine use. We've seen a lot of people drop because of Xanax, uh, MDMA, those types of things. And so we gotta, we got to not just target the highest risk folks. We also got to be looking to support the people that are on uh, quote unquote designer drugs. I think people need to get educated on this addictions crisis. Western society has been programmed on the Just Say No campaign, which was a bullshit campaign. When you go into a classroom and you tell people that drugs are going to kill them, and they know for a fact that their best friend was out doing MDMA the night before, and they look like they're having a way better time than I was. Do you think that they believe anything you say about any other drug? They're gonna think you're full of shit because you are. We need to change our approach as a society as a whole. We need to get away from uh, the enforcement strategies and we need to get into this health mentality. Cops are now saying that they need to, they, we need to decriminalize drugs. The Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police have endorsed decriminalization of drugs. Matt Ingrill is a Saskatoon police officer and the founder of the Drug Education Project Say No. He is currently working in the SPS Guns and Gangs Unit and formerly worked in the Integrated Organized Crime and Drug Units. He is one of the first of now many police officers in Saskatchewan that are calling for reform in Canada's drug policies. My final year of, uh, of the Organized Crime Unit and, and the Drug Unit, um, I'd spent a lot of time, kind of as a lot of drug cops do, uh, reminiscing on your career and I was kind of looking at the trends, the street drug trends, street pricing, um, the overall impact that, that we had and what I learned is that enforcement alone um, 
isn't successful. All of it was almost for nothing because there was more drugs available than there was when I started. There was more dangerous drugs available than when I started. I was sort of seen a, by a few, I think, as a bit of a wing nut and an outlier, whereas now this is a pretty common conversation that I think we're having at all different levels. Uh, Senator um, Boniface out of Ottawa just, just tabled the first decriminalization bill in the country for simple possession. So we're seeing um, the trend um, move in a direction of doing something different. We have to remo remove the incentive for drug trafficking and organized crime in particular. Because right now, it, the money is so lucrative um, that there will always be somebody willing to take the, the associated risks for the reward in the end. Right now, we have a meth crisis, in my opinion. Even as, you know, fentanyl was, was starting to come out and, and it's the big drug that everyone heard and now there's car fentanyl, it's even stronger. Um, meth was just sort of like flying under the radar. Meth is, is doing a lot more damage. It just doesn't have the death associated to it. But I can tell you I, that there's families that I know that would say that their son or daughter is as good as dead because of the, the way they're living their life. So in Saskatchewan, meth used to be expensive. The lowest street level use is a point, which is a tenth of a gram. That would cost like 20 or 30 bucks. The police would actually do a seizure and it would drive the price up because there was that small amount of it in the city. Well now that same point of meth is five or ten bucks to get on the street and it will be five or ten bucks forever now. Anyone that was struggling with an addiction before can now afford to be a drug trafficker. And so there's an incentive for the 20 year old gang member to be selling to his 18 year old cousin. That 18 year old cousin's like, well, I want to sell too. So then I'll sell to my 16 year old and then I'll sell to my 14 year old. And then we're seeing, you know, kids as young as 11, 12 years old using crystal meth. All the real yucky stuff that's involved in drug trafficking isn't just sort of at like one level of the game now. It's all the way through. And so if we can remove that incentive from organized crime, through a, a regulation policy, a decriminalization policy, or even a legalization policy, that takes some of that cash incentive away. And then we come in and hammering them with the enforcement that completely removes or starts to remove the incentive altogether. We have, you know, doctors and policymakers and stuff saying that, yeah, addiction is a, is a healthcare issue. But really, we're not treating it that way in our society. We're, we're still treating it as a criminal, a criminal issue, right? Like when, you know, someone's high on drugs walking down the street, you're not calling a doctor. Most people are calling the police. If, I, if I'm someone and I have some drugs in my pocket and, I, and I'm struggling with an addiction, let's say I've got a bit of heroin or fentanyl in my pocket, I come into contact with the police. Maybe I'm breaching a court order. Maybe I stole something you know, to be able to go and buy my, my fentanyl or whatever. When the police arrest me, I'm gonna have my drugs taken. I'm gonna come to the police station. I'm gonna get booked in here. Ultimately, I'm going to be released in an extremely short period of time, within a day or two. Then I have to go back out on the street. I still have my same addiction. I have to go commit another crime to fund the habit that I just, for the product that I just got taken away. I'm not going to stop. There, someone in that addiction cycle isn't stopping because the police have showed up and said, don't do that, that's wrong. Well, I'm working with people that have been trunked in cars. They grew up bouncing around foster homes, gang involvement in and out of their life, maybe fingers cut off, they've been home invaded, they've been robbed. They're also committing these crimes in order to survive. And so if in order for them to deal with the shitty upbringing that they've had and the life that they're currently living, they need to consume drugs to numb that pain, who are we to say that, that they shouldn't? Instead, we can provide them with an avenue where you're dealing with trauma, you need some support, you need drugs to deal with your pain at this moment in time. It's about meeting people where they're at. They need drugs. Here it is. Here's a safe supply that you're not going to overdose on. You're going to be getting it not from the gang member on the corner, who's also going to try to rip you, rob you, sell you shitty drugs, encourage you to commit other crimes. None of that. You're going to have continued contact with your doctor, or you're going to go to a place like Prairie Harm Reduction and use there in a safe facility. We're not advocating for teenagers to start snorting lines of coke and going to party. Our users in Saskatchewan, predominantly, um, our opiate users were predominantly using prescription drugs for a long time, for most of my career up until 
2012. We saw very few overdoses. That's because they were using a regulated substance. But then when the patent from OxyContin ran out, it opened a floodgates for an organized crime market where there was a lot of people addicted to this drug already. Prescription drugs, we've tightened up. It's way harder to get um, prescription opiates now. And so again, the, the unintended consequences that um, often happens with policymakers that don't incorporate lived experience is that we accidentally do something that makes a problem worse instead of better. And so that's why it's so important to make sure that we're talking to people that have the experience, um, getting their expertise and incorporating that into the policy of whatever it is that we're doing. Right now in Canada, um, you know, we're losing someone every couple of hours to an overdose death. And those aren't just numbers, like that's someone's family. And it's something that could completely disappear with the stroke of a pen. And that pen stroke may come in the form of Bill S-229, but it won't happen without support from the public. Bill S-229 is the first decriminalization bill um, that's been put forth on the table. The MPs are going to have to vote on, so, you know, call, <laughs> call your MPs, tell them you support this bill and that you want them to vote. You need to call your MLA and you need to call your MP and you need to tell them that you support harm reduction. Clearly we need more money into this issue. Clearly we need a better strategy and approach to this issue. Even if this bill gets voted down, it's been talked about, um, it's been thought about by the powers that be, it's gonna be thought about by more of the general population as media pick up the story and kind of ask some questions. I think a lot of people feel very alone right now and when you see the lack of action from governments, you feel like nobody cares about you. And we're here to say that you matter, we care about you, and we're going to help you on your journey as, as long as you want our help. It's one thing to be in COVID isolation, it's a whole other thing to have government be okay with hundreds of your friends and family dying. We're here to say that that's not okay. Look, if you're, if you're struggling with an addiction right now, that's okay. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel shame. You know, if you've done some stuff that you're ashamed of, everybody has. There's places to help. You know, go to somewhere like Prairie Harm Reduction if you want professional help or reach out to your friend group. And when you come out on the other side, you're gonna have a skill set that other people don't have, but is sought after and needed.